He has a long experience with public affairs in Liberia. Went to Monrovia College, spent a good deal of time in Liberia in telecommunications, and a curious little phase in Little Rock, Arkansas, in a bank. Interesting diplomatic background, Mr. Scherzer. He was, uh, has been in, in uh, the Ministry of Finance. He's in Belgium as Second Secretary, then First Secretary, the Embassy, then in Nigeria, and in the Foreign of Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Monrovia. Had a short sabbatical, and then, then he came to New York in the UN. Last year, he was made the Chargé d'Affaires of the Embassy of Liberia, and he's now about to talk to you on the subject of crisis in Liberia, which I suspect is an understatement. Going up black at. Uh, good evening. He missed one thing. He didn't say University of Detroit in Detroit, Michigan. Give them that credit. Uh, Mr. President, members of the council, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and privilege for me to address this August body this evening. Your kind invitation affords me the opportunity to discuss Liberia crisis and our continued search for peace, stability, and democracy in the country. Liberia, Africa's oldest republic, played a key role at various international forums. I've advocated the right to self-determination of all peoples, particularly those in Africa and under colonial rule. In fact, the late president of Guinea, Mr. Sekou Touré, acknowledged that for many years, oh, thank you, I quote, Liberia served as a beacon of hope to the rest of colonialized Africa, unquote. The tragic civil war in Liberia erupted on December 24, 1989, when the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, the NPFL, headed by Mr. Charles Jitter, made an incursion into Liberia from the Ivory Coast with the objective of overthrowing President Doe. Almost 10 years earlier, on April 12, 1980, Master Sergeant Doe, along with 16 enlisted men of the armed forces of Liberia, overthrew the government of Dr. William R. Tauber in the bloody coup d'etat. The president was killed, and 13 of his ministers were executed on the beach in Morovia, allegedly for committing crimes against the Liberian people. Initially, some Liberians embraced Mr. Taylor and his NPFL because they were dissatisfied with Mr. Doe's complete disregard for the rights of the people, his deliberate mismanagement of the economy, and institutionalizing tribalism and nepotism. At the beginning of the conflict, Mr. Taylor was seen by some Liberians as a savior, and he received the moral, if not financial and personal support. However, Mr. Tiller, rebel forces advanced towards Morovia. Countless atrocities were committed against the Liberian people, whom he claimed he had come to redeem, particularly those of the Madingo and Crown ethnic groups. As a result, thousands of Liberians, including women and children and foreign nationals, were forced to seek refuge in various countries within the sub-region. It was against this background that Liberians from all walks of life, as well as the leaders of the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, began an urgent search for a solution to the conflict in order to stop the inhumane and brutal killings by the warring factions, the armed forces of Liberia, the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, Independent National Patriotic Front of Liberia. One of the groups involved in the search for peaceful solution to the crisis was the Interfaith Mediation Committee, a council of Liberian Christian and Islamic leaders in the country, convened the first peace talk in Freetown, Sierra in June 1990. Early attempts to peacefully settle the conflict proved futile. Appeals were made to the United Nations 
and the Organization of African Unity to prevail upon all parties to enter into negotiations aimed at peacefully, peacefully resolving the conflict. <coughs> when the Liberian Interfaith Mediation Committee <laughs> failed to successfully mediate in the dispute, the heads of state of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, undertook mediatorial efforts in view of serious threat which the crisis posed to the stability in the sub-region. In view of the disintegration of the Do government and the breakdown of civil authority, the leaders of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, proposed a peace plan which called for the deployment of a peacekeeping force, as well as the formation of an interim government of national unity to include all warring factions, political parties, and interest groups. In August 1990, ECOWAS facilitated the convening of a national conference so that Liberians could deliberate on the future of their country. It was out of this conference that an interim government was formed to begin plans for ending the civil war and holding of free and fair elections to be conducted under international supervision and monitoring. All the parties and warring factions except the NPF had attended the conference in Banjo, the Gambia, under the auspices of the Interfaith Mediation Committee. It was at that conference that an interim government was established, and Dr. Amos Sawyer was elected interim president. Bishop Roland Dix of the, in, of the Lutheran Church as interim vice president. Immediately after the elections, Mr. Charles Taylor, head of the NPF, condemned the conference and refused to accept the results. Even though the interim government was subsequently installed in Moravia, a state of no war, no peace existed in the country. In an effort to break the impasse, the heads of state and government of ECOWAS meeting at an extraordinary summit in Bamako, Mali in November 1990, succeeded in negotiating a ceasefire declaration and urged Liberians to continue the search for peace by holding another national conference at which time the NPFL would be present. The second national conference was held in Monrovia in March 1991 with the participation of the NPFL which negotiated an agreement for the governance of the country. However, the Eufura, which attended these prelim preliminary results, was short-lived, as the conclusion reached were later rejected by the NPFL leader, Mr. Charles Taylor. The heads of state of ECOWAS established a committee of five headed by His Excellency, President Felix Houphiette Boni of the Cote d'Ivoire, <coughs> to help Liberians reach an understanding. The negotiations were held at four different meetings, which resulted in, a, in an agreement referred to as the Yamasruko Accord. The accord, the accord received support from the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, the non-aligned countries, and the United Nations Security Council. The interim government of national unity adopted several measures aimed at enhancing the MPFL's capacity to cooperate in the implementation of the understanding into which it willingly entered. Three cardinal principles were stressed since any long-term solution would depend on their implementation. One, Liberia must have a single national government whose authority covers the entire country. Two, that any democratic national government must be chosen by the Liberian people, resulting from the free and fair democratic elections conducted under international supervision. No one must be allowed to assume power by force of arms and subject the people to intimidation, cohesion, and threat of violence. Three, in order to hold free and fair democratic elections in Liberia, all warring factions must be disarmed and encamped. Until it is possible for the thousands of Liberians who have fled their homes to seek refuge 
in many parts of the world can feel secure enough to return to camping and vote without fear of retribution, the elections will be a fiasco. In order to restore lasting peace to Liberia, the three principles all learn above are seen as the best possible ways for us to proceed. Disarmament is an indispensable prerequisite to the holding of democratic elections in Liberia. This is why the interim government has insisted that this must be achieved. The experience of Angola readily attests to the importance of this arming all combatants. We cannot afford the loss of thousands of additional lives merely because a losing party who continues to bear arms determines that having lost the leadership of a country through the electoral process, it should reclaim it by force of arms. Mr. President, on October 15, 1992, the NPFL launched an attack on Morovia. They call it the Operation Octopus, to take over Morovia and install Mr. Chiller as president. The attack took Ekoma by surprise, but they were able to finally repel the NPFL attack. The attack caused the loss of thousands of innocent lives, both Liberians and foreigners. The death of the five American nuns is an example of the brutality unleashed by the NPFL upon the people of Liberia, as had occurred in 1990 when the NPFL, under the pretense of liberating the country, embarked upon a fierce competition with the late Samuel Kedo to win the Nobel Prize for Human Brutality and Massacre. <laughs> Since its Inception, the interim government of national unity has maintained that it has no objection to Mr. Tiller becoming president of Liberia, if that is his ambition. However, he must do so by pursuing the course through the ballot box. That message has been carried from one city to another in Africa and around the world. To accomplish this objective, the interim government has made every effort to accommodate and encourage Mr. Tiller. It should be recalled that President Sawyer offered to resign if this amendment and incumbent would proceed in earnest, and if it could bring peace to Liberia and ensure the continue, continuation of the electoral process. This is his only request, because given the experience of the civil conflict and 10 years rule of Mr. Doe, Mr. Tiller must gave the democratic process a chance to truly work. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is with deep satisfaction that I, pref that I inform you that with the assistance of the United Nations, ECOWAS, and the OAU, the Liberians have reached a consensus for solving their conflict. The plan to which we have committed ourselves is the holding of free and democratic elections under international supervision. However, the precondition for holding of election is the creation of adequate security arrangement throughout the country. In this regard, there, the agreement signed in Cotonou, Benin on July 24, 1993 is most encouraging. At the meeting, the Liberian parties manifested both their will and resolve to succeed by, by agreeing to encamp and disarm all forces under the supervision of an expanded ECOMA. They declare a general ceasefire which came into effect August 1, 1993, followed by the formation of a transitional government which will lead the country to democratic elections scheduled for early 1994. As a follow-up, to the conclusion reached at the meeting, Liberians have since met again in Cotonou, Benin, and have elected the officials of the transitional government who would take over the affairs of state when the disarmament process commences. The United Nations has established an observer mission in Liberia which will help to monitor the ceasefire 
and work along with ECMO and the Warren factions to ensure full compliance with the Cotonou Agreement leading to disarmament and holding of elections by February or March 1994. Mr. President, if we have learned anything at all from this conflict, it should be that our future is linked to the political, social, and economic development of the sub-region and the entire continent. Liberians now recognize that we owe a debt of gratitude to the countries of the sub-region for coming to our assistance at a critical period in our national existence. It is through the sub-regional efforts that the prospects for peace have been enhanced. We are optimistic that the efforts will not be in vain and that Liberians will forge ahead and achieve a lasting peace. Even though some Liberians have argued that the 1980 coup d'etat and the subsequent 1989 civil conflict were attempts to address some of the inequities in our society. However, civil strife or wars have not settled our problems, but merely created additional ones. Every war, every conflict in the world has its reverberations and is a contribution to tension and, and instability and to some extent, humanity in one way or another is affected. In conclusion, the Cotonou Agreement is an expression by the parties to the conflict to resolve the differences and establish durable peace in the country. It is hoped that Liberians will henceforth devote their resources and energies to the primary task of advancing their welfare and being mindful that resulting to force of arms to correct societal ills will prove counterproductive. Thank you. There are two questions. One in general, how is the balance of trade working out? And uh, how are you dealing with the problem of rice importation? Well, to answer your question, as you know, we are still in this civil war crisis. And the area where um, rice is being produced, obviously, is still under control by the uh, NPFL. Therefore, we are not producing any rice. But uh, the United Nations and other and, and the international community have been very helpful in supplying rice, plus the United States to 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 uh, the displaced people and uh, the refugee. Um, the area that, that is basically controlled by the tiller element of the NPFL is the resource base of the country. And therefore, there's nothing coming out of it. With the scarce resources we have to, to, to take care of a tremendous problem, so we don't even have anything going for us at this particular time. Hopefully, when we pull together and have one country under one leadership, we hope that we'll be able to move forward. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, Using the, uh, your Liberian experience, uh, would you comment upon the uh, potential for non-UN peacekeepers? Well, let's talk about internal conflict first. I mean, that's a good question. Um, it's something, it's a new element, not only to Africa, but to uh, the UN. At one time, no one wanted to, to deal with it. And if you uh, were a former colony, perhaps that, that, that power went to, to solve your problem. But what has happened in, in Liberia, and I think um, when it first started, when the Civil War first started, what we saw happening, we saw uh, the region uh, taking initiative, we saw the region getting itself involved to finding a solution. Oh. I, I believe the question is to, uh, to explain the difficulty of uh, having the interim government installed, referring, putting it in a general context of peacekeeping approaches that would seem most viable. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, perhaps you don't have a copy of the peace agreement. We will make sure we send you one so you can read when it dealt with the issue of 
encampment disarmament with military process. I think you were wrong when you said Suklo or the president of Benin uh, has been asking the question what's wrong with the transitional government coming in. No, I think he made it clear the other day that the military process is the key to everything. After the military process, then the political process will come in. Cooperate, then the, the transitional government will come in. I, I believe the question is, how unrealistic is your disarmament endeavor, the uh, election date, and the possibilities of stability and peace after such elections, if and when they're held? I think I share your concern. Uh, we can go back and discuss this from one end to another, but I think what has happened, firstly, let me tell you what transpired at the Cotonou, in Cotonou, Benin. Uh, they have agreed to uh, disarm and encamp. Maybe you're not comfortable with that. Under the ex under an expanded ECOMOT forces, three countries already will be, will be sending troops to Liberia, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. And they will be deployed all over the country with the existing ECOMOS on the ground, ex existing ECOMOS forces on the ground to help in this process. Where we have to be sincere with ourselves, I think we will have to play a key role ourselves if we want peace and stability it will start within us and help and cooperate with the forces to disarm and destroy those weapons. It will take all of us. Thank you. Hmm. I, I believe the question, <laughs> this is a marvelous system yeah, we have yeah, for yeah. doing this. The, uh, the question I believe is asking for your comment upon whether in Nigeria or other countries in Africa, presumably including Liberia as well, there might be uh, the same kind of uh, breakup of states as was witnessed in the former Yugoslavia? Well, I can't speak for Nigeria. I should attempt to talk for Liberia. Let, um, we hope not. I think we've passed that stage of dividing Liberia into different ethnic groups. Uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we hope that we'll be honest and true to ourselves we want one country. All of the fashions have echoed that. And that's a clear indication we will not have that kind of division like we see it in Yugoslavia. And we keep our finger crossed and keep praying. <laughs> Question which you're not going to not welcome <laughs> is, is, is what can everybody in this room uh, reflect upon and do with respect to helping success in the elections in the next year and in the days following? You answered the question, didn't you? <laughs> no, firstly, I'd like to say um, when I received the invitation, uh, I was surprised. Uh, but pleased to know that this August body uh, have Liberia on its agenda. And you will help to sensitize the problem we have in Liberia. And this will signal a message across, and a signal a message to the power that be, and you can help in that process. The, the follow-up question from spontaneously from the front row, are there any specific ways that you might uh, advise the people in the audience? You don't have to, but if there are, we're, we're welcome. Well, you, you, by being concerned, by, by support, being very supportive through NGOs, uh, going to, to Congress and, and, and sensitizing the Liberian crisis, the Liberian issue in itself, uh, demonstrate that you are playing a role. And uh, what has happened here, we're, we're pleased to say that uh, the U.S., at the United Nations, a resolution was passed uh, creating a trust 
fund. And this trust fund is, it was strictly to help the ex expanded ECOMOD forces. The U.S. has been the first to contribute. You've played a role because you have contributed towards that trust fund and, and have also and have promised to give more. The question is, will Liberians living in other countries be able to vote in the upcoming elections? Well, I cannot answer that question right now. I'm not even part of the election commission. But we will find answers for you. The election commission was suspended, and they are going to be reactivated. I'm sure they would take that, that your concern into account. The question is, if Mr. Taylor won't cooperate, is there any way of dealing with him? Uh, last year, I think before uh, his second attack on Morovia, a resolution was passed by the UN imposing sanction in <coughs> the territory held by Taylor. And it has worked. It has worked. I think that's one of the, um, <coughs> one is, as I was told, uh, one of the best sanctions that I've ever had. So economically, I, I, don't, I don't think he's, he's capable of, uh, of, of, of us supporting another war financially. And um, even right after, right after the peace agreement, you could see that with the border right now being closed, there was nothing coming in or going out of his, his territory. They had to establish a corridor, a safe corridor for food to come from Morovia and also from uh, Basa to be distributed into his territory. But we must not lose sight of this. We must keep uh, uh, pressure on Mr. Taylor. And the, the international community, including the U.S., should continue its pressure so that he can cooperate and let peace take a chance. The uh, question is, would you advise one to uh, travel in Liberia and, uh, or to reside there? And uh, I guess the general question is just how secure do you think Liberia is at the present time? I spent all of July there, and I'm back. <laughs> so that's a good indicator. Well, firstly, you must have a passport, <laughs> and you must apply well, for quite, a visa. Quite naturally, uh, uh, but quite naturally, but actually, actually uh, being here for, for, uh, for a while, what would you advise a person to do by actually going there? I think you have to say that it's secure in Liberia, and, uh, and perhaps you could describe how, what the tourist... Uh, possibilities are, and if indeed it is safe. You, you asked if we have an embassy. Yes, we do have an embassy. You know. Would you advise me to go there? Well, yeah, if you so desire. Uh, but there are areas that wouldn't be safe for you to go to. Uh, the area that is not held on an, the control of ECOMA, you can go there. You can go in those areas. But if you so desire to move to Liberia, you can come to the embassy and fill up the necessary document, and you have to meet the, uh, the consular requirement, then we'll grant you a visa. You can go there and exploit it for yourself, and you can make the decision what you want to do after you've gone there. The question is, uh, what is Mr. Taylor's background, and who armed and supported him uh, in the early stages? Myself is asking that question. <laughs> no, we. I mean, there have been many um, information circulated that uh, Mr. Taylor was trained in um, in uh, Libya and in Burkina Faso, and uh, obviously the the ammunition came from 
Libya into Burkina Faso, and Africa was used as a safe haven, as a corridor to get the ammunition into the country. Uh, Taylor worked for the Douglas government. He was uh, the GSA director. Prior to that, I didn't know Mr. Taylor. The question is, when does the disarmament process begin? Well, it's past due, let's put it this way. Um, the problem is, Mr. Tiller said that he didn't want to use the existing troops or the ECOMO troops on the ground. He wanted a new set of troops, not from the region, but from other regions. And obviously, the, the interim government uh, been, uh, been sympathetic towards his, uh, his concern. Uh, accepted that. So we are still waiting for the new expanded ECOMO forces to come on the ground. And it takes money. Someone has to pay for it. We have a budget of $60 million. As I mentioned earlier here, that uh, the United States has been very generous, have just given to us <coughs> $19.83 as the first phase and uh, we're hopeful that something will be forthcoming from the United States. And we, 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 we hope that you too can uh, try to sensitize these issues that the whole world will be able to cooperate and give the necessary funding so we can get this, this armament and encampment on the way. I believe the question is, and, and you can certainly clarify it if this isn't uh, correct, uh, I believe the question is, is there not a contradiction between uh, even the fund which you suggest and the absence of consensus-like negotiations going on? Uh, isn't there a contradiction between those conditions and the hope that you um, attribute to the Benin process? Uh, Mr. David, yes, I do share your concern, I think. All Liberians are concerned why the transitional government has not yet taken, taken the uh, control of the fate of the state. But uh, we know, as I mentioned earlier to you, the military process has to be taken care of first. In order to do that, right now we don't even have the, uh, the troops, the expanded, ECOMA on the ground right now has the capacity and the ability to disarm and encamp if they were given the opportunity to do that. But as I said, Mr. Tiller has said that he does not want the existing ECOMO forces on the ground. He wants a new set of forces to come, okay? So we are waiting on the new forces. And for them to do so, it would take some financial means. And I mentioned earlier that uh, there is a budget, a proposed budget, in the amount of $60 million. We are looking for, we are hopeful that we'll be able to get this so that the process can get on our way. I don't think the Indian government will stay in one day when the disarmament and encampment process commences. I think a version of that has been asked, but again, the question is, because it's a central point, uh, is not Mr. Taylor uh, recalcitrant, unyielding, and uh, how are you going to deal with him if indeed uh, that's his position? Well, you spell it out in detail. <laughs> what can I say about that? Uh, yes, we. We are very concerned about that. We know the man is intransigent. And what has, what has happened is the United Nations itself has involved itself into the whole process. And if you can recall, before the peace agreement was, was signed, ECOMO was moving into his territory. They were using military means to achieve its objective. But we had Liberians all over crying out, you're killing our people. We're killing our people with the war must stop. Obviously, for humanitarian reasons, it, was, it, it, it stopped the war and decided to go back to the table, back to the drawing board to find a peaceful solution to the problem here where we are right now.
the, uh, I think that's an appropriate dilemma to be left with, an extraordinarily difficult circumstance uh, with which uh, I think people of the United States can only wish you the very best in your effort to work out the resolution at this particular stage. Baltimoreans have a, a special link. There's a long time vigorous sister city relationship with one of your, your cities. Um, and so I think with the, uh, the warmth of that relationship, we wish you the very best in your endeavors. Thank you very much for a marvelously clear presentation.